I'd like to begin by uh, complimenting the art director for The Atlantic uh, very cleverly uh, with this this particular image. And you see the uh, um, the uh, spinning <laughs> geared wheel there and in on the website, it is spinning. And this is to indicate uh, the seemingly endless misery, uh, symbolic of post-viral syndromes. Uh, and in fact, it's if you think about it, the, a spinning wheel like this means that the image is struggling to download, and that's, that's often the, cause, the the reason for that is a, vi a computer virus. So, quote: "The miserable have no other medicine but only hope." Unquote. That is from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, and measuring is actually the uh, a key factor in uh, in the the whole long COVID and po other post viral syndromes in that. It, they are very difficult to measure. Uh, there are no diagnostic tests for long COVID as such. Uh, no biomarkers, for example, uh, no PCR test or, or, uh, or uh, antigen test from saliva or, or antibody test to show uh, previous um, from blood to show previous infection. So we have a long way to go to, to uh, sort this out. So long COVID is a bewildering array of symptoms, some 200 in all, perhaps more. It seems that no organ or tissue is spared. And uh, I came across this quote that I think applies. Variability is the only constant. So it is a uh, constellation of, of uh, clinical symptoms. Pandemic headlines. I just pulled a few of these out, uh, thinking they would be uh, they would give you an idea of the, uh, uh, of the of what we're dealing with here. The pandemic erased two decades of progress in math and reading. Why has COVID nineteen been especially harmful for work, working women? U.S. life expectancy falls again in historic setback. The decline during the pandemic is the sharpest in nearly one hundred years. Native American and Alaskan and Native in Alaskan Native communities are particularly hard hit. All right, so in 1918 to 1920 influenza pandemic, the CDC estimates about 50 million people died. Of those 675,000 Americans died, that's about one to 2% of the global total with our four to 5% of the population. We still have today, four to 5% of the world population. About um, a little more than a million Americans have died, and uh, and that accounts for seventeen percent mm -hmm. of the global total. So we've gone mm -hmm. we've gone from one to two percent to seventeen percent, and one at wonders how this is possible, given that our country is, at, after all, a leader, the leader in medical science, and we were, in fact, uh, as many of you know, uh, uh, we were designated as the most prepared or pandemic prior to the pandemic. This is uh, a quote from a newsletter that I uh, subscribe to uh, by the uh, very uh, highly regarded economist Adam Tu is how China, Cuba and Albania came to have higher life expectancy than the US. Whatever else a society should do, whatever else a political system promises, it should ensure that citizens have a healthy life expectancy commensurate mm. with their nation's overall <clears throat> economic development. Long COVID, <clears throat> and this is the, the, the econ more the economic side of things. Uh, one in five of 600 reported, um, 650 a million reported cases uh, of COVID go on to develop long COVID or about 20%. That's, that's it. the range is ten to thirty percent, but let's say twenty percent. That would account. That would mean one hundred and thirty billion people worldwide, uh, and in the U.S., it estimated eighteen million, or in that neighborhood. Workforce issues. A recent study showed that five hundred that the U.S. workforce has been redu uh, reduced by half a million people as a result of long COVID, reducing total labor earnings by about nine thousand per individual or 18% over 14 months. This is all part of what's, uh, uh, what's called the great resignation or quiet quitting, the, the workforce uh, uh, hit that long COVID in large part has caused. Uh, David Cutler, who is an 
a Harvard health economist estimates the total cost of long COVID, considering quality of life, misery, suffering, lost earnings, medical costs is, is or will be when done $3.7 trillion. That is a, an estimate that has grown from $2.6 <clears> trillion <throat> that, some, that uh, David <clears throat> Cutler and former Treasury, Treasury Secretary uh, Larry Summers estimated two years ago. And they're using $11,000 per individual based on the, as a guide, uh, the, the roughly $8,000 cost of patients who have myalgic encephalomyelitis, which is a chronic fatigue syndrome. They're using that as a basis. And you'll see chronic fatigue syndrome associated uh, with long COVID in, in many contexts. The federal government is responding uh, with a $1.12 billion investment uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a de- two-pronged uh, effort, the National Research Action Plan on Long COVID, of which the Recover Research Cons- Consortium is important. And this is a volunteer sign-up uh, with the target of 40,000 40, individuals signing up. They are at 8,000 some now. I encourage people to to uh, go to recovercovid.org and sign up, including healthy controls. They need them. More than 70 uh, funded research projects thus far, but it's been fairly slow to uh, to uh, mm-hmm. move through the system. Uh, and that is that is an ongoing problem. The second prong, the services and support for long term impacts of COVID report to address the longer term effects of mm-hmm. COVID-19, including uh, long COVID related conditions, and that's a, that's an important point because the related conditions I I don't know, but I'm assuming would include uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and other syndromes that uh, that I'll mention here shortly, and that Dr. Belfour will be talking about. A couple other initiatives: the patient led re- research collaborative is a group of long COVID patients who are also researchers, and they are they are they span the biomedical spectrum in terms of their specialization and. Interdisciplinarity is key if we're going to understand long COVID. It is not a one or two subspecialties that are going to answer the questions. And then just recently, I think last week, a privately funded long COVID research initiative was launched to see if SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus is still present in those who have long COVID, and if so, how it may be contributing to their ailments. And this is a group of billionaires who have a target of raising $100 million dollars and they are at 15 uh, million right now. And that last, and lastly, a slide from a, a key a paper that really uh, uh, influenced our uh, effort with the Atlantic. Um, and this is a, uh, uh, a uh, table from an important paper published last May. Uh, and Yale immunologist Akiko Iwasaki uh, is key uh, in, in this particular effort. You'll see uh, on the, um, these are systematic chronic illnesses. You see on the left viral pathogens highlighted in yellow there and, and in I'll mention a, a few in that are there in blue. Post-polio syndrome that can be 15 to 40 years after the initial infection that you come down with post-polio <laughs> syndrome. Dr. Balfour will talk about Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, just let me mention that Dr. Iwasaki regards it as one of three potential candidates for the uh, of how how long covid comes about basically we all most of us more than 90% of us have had uh, uh, ebv and it goes latent it is dormant and then the virus the coronavirus comes along and activates it that's a that's one theory and then h1n1 that's the uh, pandemic uh, uh, virus uh, influenza pandemic virus of uh, 1918 1920 and that uh, has has uh, post viral consequences as well, and many of them neurologic, including including uh, uh, Parkinson disease, a higher incidence. And lastly, I'm going to mention post treatment Lyme disease syndrome (PTLD) PTLDS. Uh, that is a bacterial consequence, but uh, uh, a disease with consequences. And the country singer Shania Twain was infected in 2003. Uh, I was treated and had all sorts of problems, including two vocal cord surgeries following it. 
uh, and it was a pretty miserable experience for her. I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Balfour, and Hank, take it away. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good morning, and thank you, too, to the organizers of TC Talks for inviting the two of us to, to discuss. It's not just long COVID. <clears throat> Next slide, Bill, please. <clears throat> well, you see in this one, and uh, I like the uh, grinding wheel. It's uh, never quite uh, ending. And that's kind of uh, the picture with long COVID. But the reason that we wrote this article, next slide, please, is that we are aware of a number of infectious pathogens shown here on the uh, image that Bill also showed you mostly viral, but also some bacteria and one parasite that have been associated with long-term problems. We call them in medicine sequelae, long-term problems after the acute illness. And they've been collectively called post-acute infection syndromes. Next slide, please. Our laboratory focus for a number of years has been on Epstein-Barr virus, the cause of infectious mononucleosis, but also a virus that has long consequences, including cancers and autoimmune diseases, especially multiple sclerosis. Next slide, please. The uh, opportunity to write an essay piece for The Atlantic came after I was invited to uh, have an interview with Atlantic editor Sarah Zhang, who then put a piece together on Epstein-Barr virus and uh, felt that it was a good, good fit to talk to another editor, Rebecca Rosen, uh, who had uh, two concerns about long COVID. One was long COVID unique or not to the uh, infectious disease world? And secondly, is it true that women are more afflicted with the complications of these illnesses long-term than men? And the simple answer to that is yes. But the reason for that is we don't know. Next slide, please. All right, just a little bit about Epstein-Barr virus. It was discovered in 1964 by this trio, Tony Epstein, Berta Chong. Bert uh, was a, an Irish virologist, and Yvonne Barr, who was a graduate student of Tony Epstein at the time. There are three people here, Tony, Bert, and Yvonne, and uh, the virus is called Epstein-Barr virus. So Bert somehow got squeezed out in the uh, long run, and uh, I use this slide as an example for my graduate students, telling them when you uh, start your research, be not to be the middleman. Next slide, please. So the discovery uh, involved the use of the electron microscope to show particles of, at that time, it was called a herpes virus, and it is a herpes virus, but it's a unique one, inside the cells of tissue that had been sent by Dennis Burkett to Tony Epstein. Uh, and uh, this is tissue that came from a jaw tumor that subsequently that disease has been called Burkett lymphoma, a cancer of the lymph glands of the neck and, uh, and head area. Next slide, please. Well, this is the beginning of what uh, a primary Epstein-Barr virus infection looks like. In many cases, particularly among our young college students, a severe sore throat accompanies the acute infection. And shown here is a, a, a boy with quite significant pharyngitis, enlargement of the tonsils with the tonsils, uh, touching uh, an enlarged uh, uvula, that little thing that sticks down uh, between uh, the throat. Next slide, please. Well, what we've learned in about two decades of research on 
Epstein-Barr virus and related infections is that among our University of Minnesota college freshmen, 25% will develop a primary EBV infection during their first two semesters of university. And of those 25%, three quarters of them will get mono with a median length of 21 days, three weeks. So that means that uh, half of the students who get sick are sick for 21 days and uh, another, another half are sick for longer. The major route of transmission undoubtedly is exchange of, uh, of oral secretions, particularly during deep kissing. And importantly, and not surprisingly, you can find EBV in the oral cavity and in the blood of individuals before they actually develop uh, infectious mono. And so this explains why the disease among socially active uh, adults is, uh, is so easy to get. Our freshmen uh, also, because uh, the attack rate is so high, are ideal subjects for a preventative vaccine trial that we are planning to do next year in collaboration with the National Institutes of Health. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is really a dramatic picture showing how EBV infection is related to Hodgkin lymphoma. This uh, was published in the New England Journal a few years ago by uh, a group of Danish researchers who showed that you could actually plot an incubation period for Hodgkin's disease in terms of the number of years after acute infectious mononucleosis. And the peak of that incubation period is about three years. If you didn't have EBV in your uh, uh, Hodgkin's disease uh, tissue, that, uh, that's the red lines. You see no harm, no foul, nothing. But if you are EBV tissue positive, uh, the probability is quite high that you will develop uh, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma within about three years after you have experienced infectious mononucleosis. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so multiple sclerosis, and it's been in the headlines a lot this year due to two seminal publications that I'll briefly go over, but there are at least five lines of evidence supporting the concept that EBV is the cause or at least the major environmental risk factor for developing multiple sclerosis. And the evidence is that essentially all patients with multiple sclerosis have previously been infected by EBV. And this is, was amplified in a paper this year. Their specific antibody levels are elevated, especially against EBNA1. And that is basically a, an EBV protein that's very important in maintaining a viral latency. A history of mono increases the risk of developing MS significantly. And then special uh, killer type uh, T, T lymphocytes are elevated during acute multiple sclerosis. And then uh, Italian uh, researchers have reported that EBV material indicative of the, that viral replication has taken place are seen in the brain tissue of MS patients who uh, expired. And lastly, uh, maybe a, a sixth uh, line of evidence is that if you uh, teach uh, T cells to recognize EBV and then use them to try to treat MS, there's been some success, which supports the notion that active EBV infection is at least in part responsible for the progression of MS. Next slide, please. Now, those studies that have really uh, shed quite a bit of light on the MS-EBV connection uh, are going to be shown in the next couple of images. Here is a paper by the Harvard group headed up by Alberto Asherio, which uh, the key line here is the risk of multiple sclerosis increased 32 fold after infection with EBV. That's a huge amount, but was not increased after infection with other viruses. 
And this was the result of testing thousands of samples that the military had stored away uh, and had created quite an impressive uh, bio uh, base to uh, examine, which the Harvard workers did. And then next slide, please. The other piece of evidence, and I certainly don't expect people to read this, I just want to show <laughs> that there are like uh, 20 authors to this. This was a huge project that basically showed that cells uh, from patients with MS learned to recognize EBNA1, which we mentioned before, as being elevated in MS patients. But then that cell also recognized a human uh, central nervous system protein called gliocam. And so the fact that the cell was going to recognize and get rid of EBV also meant that the cell was going to recognize and damage or get rid of an essential human brain protein. Again, emphasizing the possibility that uh, molecular mimicry, so-called, is the uh, is at the basis of the pathogenesis of EBV multiple sclerosis. Next slide, please. I'm going to come back to this and say. Look at all the uh, viruses and a couple of bacteria and a parasite that have been associated with lingering or recurring uh, problems after the acute infection, so-called post-acute infection syndrome. And next slide, please. I, I have an opinion about how this is all taking place, and I want to emphasize it's only an opinion. But the question is, what do these uh, 15, 16 acute infection syndromes have in common, post-acute infection syndromes have in common? Genetic predisposition. I think there's no question that uh, there are certain genetic uh, polymorphisms that are related to susceptibility to having a more severe infection versus getting away with a mild infection or an asymptomatic infection. You have to have an infection, of course, to have post-infection syndrome. And so that's a, a necessary piece. But then the final aspect, cell damage resulting in autoantibody formation. Uh, I think in all these cases, cells are damaged and they release a, a number of proteins that uh, can be then recognized by the immune system incorrectly as foreign, and the immune system tends to scavenge them out uh, when they're actually essential for the integrity of the cell's function. So what do I think is our best defense, at least at present? Vaccination. And this has been clearly shown to modify or uh, reduce the risk of long COVID. And so with that having been said, my last slide encourages all of you, if you haven't already, to get a bivalent COVID booster. And bivalent is meant that uh, the material that causes your immune system to react in the vaccine contains both elements of the earlier Delta virus and elements of the newly occurring Omicron viruses, particularly the BA4 and the BA5 strains. And so I'm just going to read this quote uh, from the uh, combined knowledge that we have so far about these bivalent boosters. Protective antibody from the initial shots declines about 15% every month after a person has received a single booster, but getting a new booster dose completely restores those antibody levels and provides strong protection against severe COVID. And this was a study uh, published just a few weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. I wanna close by thanking all of you for listening to our presentation. Bill and I are delighted to have been invited to do this, and uh, we in turn invite your uh, questions. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Um, if people have questions, you can just jump in or put them in the chat. A question? Sure. Okay, um, I'm trying to get my picture here. Um, my name is Anise Gregerson. It has to do with finding the right time for going forward with the next um, the next vaccination when you've already had the two original vaccines, two boosters, and now wondering about the timing. Is it better to kind of put it off if you have had ap ap maybe four months since the last uh, booster and knowing that we're going through the fall, is that the higher risk or is it the holiday season that's a higher risk? It's just the idea of timing and how long does one have the effectiveness of their vaccination continue at a level that's high enough that can keep you safe? I don't know. Well, those are wonderful questions. And uh, to start off, to be honest with you, we don't know. We, we have data to suggest that it's better to wait at least two months after an immunization or after you've gotten COVID, what, natural COVID, until you get a, a, a booster, thinking that it, it, it's hard to boost high level antibody. But as the antibody declines, it's easier to boost it back up. The real truth of the matter is that we're seeing the virus evolve constantly. For example, We've had these two Omicron variants, BA4, BA5, and now we've got a 2.75 variant running around, at least that's what the wastewater people tell us. So then is it going to be the same for those viruses? We don't know. But what I think, what I, my opinion is that the, uh, the uh, uh, bivalent or polyvalent boosters for coronavirus are going to be yearly injections, just like influenza. So that's the kind of thing that I think is going on. Uh, now, when is the epidemic going to peak, if we're going to have a peak? Uh, all of us are concerned about several issues regarding the fall. One is that viruses of the respiratory type, and coronavirus is a respiratory virus, seem to thrive better in the fall and winter months than they do in the spring and summer. And so we think there's likely gonna be an uptick in viral activity. Uh, now, whether that's augmented by the holidays is hard to tell. I think it probably will be. The biggest factor that's unknown right now is how much herd immunity do we have? And I think mm -hmm. most of you on, on the, uh, Zoom know that herd immunity means that enough of the folks in that community have been infected or have been vaccinated such that transmission person to person can't occur. And I think we're seeing a little bit of an element of that in that uh, uh, we know how many have been infected and tested at certain sites, but we have no idea how many have been infected and tested at home and not reported. Plus, you've got uh, a large number of the population, not enough, but a large number of the population vaccinated. So that's going to be another factor that can that turn off the, uh, the propensity for the virus to, uh, uh, you know, to infect the community. Uh, does that answer your question or have I skipped a few pieces? No, no. God bless you. That's very helpful. And thank you both for your presentation. I forgot to add that. Very, very informative. You're, you're very welcome. If I may add to what Hank has said in the context of long COVID, uh, as I understand it, President, Vi President Biden said last night that the pandemic is over. He said that in 60 minutes. I think that came as something of a surprise. What's certain is that long COVID is not over. Mm -hmm. More people are coming down with long COVID than are recovering from it. And as long as you have the high, an infection rate up, up into the half a million a day worldwide, you're going to have a lot of cases of long COVID. That, uh, the, the reality is uh, that uh, this is a silent crisis uh, that we're dealing with here. And it's becoming, you know, I listen to uh, commentators talk about economics and, and the worker shortage. And they almost never talk about on COVID that makes a significant contribution to the worker shortage in this country and I presumably around the world. Someone with a hand up there. Sure. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, so 
Uh, let me ask you if you think this is uh, long COVID related. So last uh, Christmas, my son-in-law came and the rest of his family, three little girls and his wife, came down with uh, COVID. Uh, my son-in-law is 6'4", 325 pounds, former college football player, strong as an ox, huge guy. Uh, and uh, so got COVID. A month after COVID, he was in the ER and was in either the ER or the cardio uh, recovery unit with uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome dash a, which means adults. Uh, he, he almost died. Every organ was inflamed. His heart extraction factor was in the 30s. His fever was 105.5. He was delirious for uh, uh, about five days. He was in uh, intensive care there for uh, nine days. When he woke up, he, he could whisper, but he couldn't talk. But the doctor came in. And she was, uh, you're, you're talking. And he says, did you think I was going to die? And she said, the whole medical team thought you were going to die. But we saved your life. And now it's your turn, she says. So he did make it out of that. He went through a full cardio rehab thing. And then uh, a couple of months ago, he, he came down with anaphylaxis. And into the ER again, Benadryl got, got him through. He was only there for a short period of time. He's never had in his life any, any kind of, uh, he's never been sensitive to anything. Well, he got anaphylaxis as well. And then he went to, uh, uh, you know, he had things checked out and says, well, now you're sensitive to grass and leaves. Well, that's <laughs> how... Do you see that as, as typical, not typical, but likely symptoms of long COVID? Would you throw that in that bucket? I think it's definitional, actually, and it really doesn't matter whether you call it uh, severe primary COVID with uh, long-term effects or sequelae or whether you call it long COVID. I think it's, I think it's due to uh, SARS-CoV-2. For sure, the, the the virus that's uh, responsible for uh, the COVID illness. But uh, the thing is, these are immunologic mistakes or aberrations that he's having. And that's my whole theory is that the immune system gets hit. And particularly, the central nervous system gets involved, the breathing gets involved, and now you've got some hypersensitivity to uh, substances, probably proteins in the air or what have you, or foods. And so that's what I think. So it's clearly, I would say, SARS-CoV-2 related. And whether you want to define it as long COVID or simply severe primary COVID, I, I think the uh, it, it really doesn't matter. I think that's more semantic, to be honest with you. Okay. It was noted that he also had Epstein-Barr virus in his system from when he was very young and had... Uh, right, uh, and that's... The, the, uh, let, uh, let me say this. <clears throat> EBV is a member of the herpes virus family. And the herpes virus family is extremely unique in that all members of the family, and there are nine members of the family, actually, uh, are able to establish latency in the human body. That means the virus is capable of multiplying. We call it replication. The virus is capable of multiplying at any time. And if there's an immunologic stress, and it can be as simple as a flu vaccination or as severe as a severe case of COVID, either of those can trigger the reappearance of these viruses that have been latent. And EBV is most common of all the herpes viruses in becoming uh, reactivated and found in the blood, so much so that there are, uh, is still a theory that it's uh, EBV in the blood that's causing these symptoms. I think not. I think EBV is following the course of, there's another reason for the immunosuppression, 
I'll take advantage of it and start multiplying again. Does Thank that make you. sense? Yes, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and one um, is, uh, has Israel Israel's research on MS been helpful in studying long COVID? That's a wonderful question. And that's actually one of the postulates that uh, that Bill and I have about it's not just long COVID. If we can put research on uh, uh, together on these various viruses, particularly the ones that have a predilection for causing long-term effects, I think we may learn from one to the other. So I think it's very probable that research could be aimed at post-acute viral infection syndromes as a group rather than just studying long COVID in a vacuum. Thank you. Um, the next question is, does long COVID exacerbate existing memory problems, such as forgetfulness with aging? Is there an idea how long long COVID lasts? Because we're still fairly early in the epidemic, I don't think we can say with certainty how long long COVID is going to last. I think experience with uh, 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 chronic infectious mono, which we've had a little, is that there's a huge variation in how long it lasts from months to years. And uh, the majority of subjects with the chronic uh, infectious mononucleosis get better between six and 12 months. I think that's the story roughly for long COVID, but there's huge variability. And I think that variability relates to genetic predisposition. If I might add uh, something along the same lines, we hear the term brain fog used quite a lot. If we use right. it in, in our article. Uh, and uh, Ed Young at The Atlantic last week published a major piece on so-called brain fog. And uh, we can measure fog, but we, we, have, we struggle to measure brain fog, uh, as I told others. Uh, so I recommend uh, reading that piece to to, to understand that, that that brain fog is a is a is a thing, and it's a it it is very disabling and can last many many months, sometimes years. I have a question. I read yesterday, um, I don't know where, um, something about when um, people who have who had depression and anxiety. Um, because had have struggled with it for a period of time, and they get COVID. That fifty percent of those people will get long COVID, and it will exacerbate the anxiety and depression. Does that is that anything that you're familiar with? Well, it's a it's a theory that's uh, needs to be obviously drawn out with more data. But I think one of the findings that uh, we're going to come up with in the propensity to develop long COVID is immunologic competence. And there's no question that people that are constantly, uh, you know, under stress, uh, depressed, what have you, have already long going immunologic damage just because the psyche, the, neuro, neuro, uh, the neurosystem, and the immune system are all closely related, closely intertwined, and they speak to each other. Uh, through substances that they can produce and put in the bloodstream. And I think that uh, uh, if you disrupt one of these areas uh, and you're disrupting it, if you're chronically depressed or you're chronically anxious, what have you, you're setting yourself up to be in the category of someone who's actually immunosuppressed and then more likely to develop the side effects and long-term uh, symptoms of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. That's disturbing for many people. Um, we have another question. Is there a tumor, or I'm sorry, is there a rumor or is there any scientific evidence which suggests certain blood types are more protected? The data on that has not been confirmed. So the answer to that, to, the answer is at the moment, no. More questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question if you have another 
I, I have one more question. Um, throughout uh, our history, we get waves of these diseases coming through. This COVID has impacted uh, all, has impacts all over the world. Will this, is this a prelude to other known things like the Black Plague and things like that? Uh, because we're all somewhat weakened, our immune systems are somewhat weakened? I think the issue with these pandemics is more related to travel and to bringing all parts of the world together, you know, through uh, mainly airplane travel now. And the fact that anywhere in the globe, if we have a, a significant mutation of an otherwise harmless virus, we have the potential to seed a new epidemic or even possibly a pandemic. I think that's more or less the issue. We, <clears throat> the plague and all of those uh, were pretty much the result of poor hygiene plus lack of any type of antimicrobial therapy that, that we could stop the, the, uh, the disease from. Now we're faced with more of a, uh, a readiness or a preparedness deal where we need to have enough supplies of masks and things like that. And we didn't at the beginning of the uh, epidemic. And we were badly misled by our leadership uh, who downplayed for a long time the real importance of SARS-CoV-2 and uh, COVID-19. Thank you. We have another question. What is your opinion about getting the regular flu shot, the annual flu shot at the same time as the COVID vaccine? That's what I got. <laughs> so that's my recommendation. I think it's perfectly fine, except you got to do them in separate arms. Uh, because if there's a side effect, you're not going to know when they record it, if it's due to the COVID immunization or to the flu immunization. And I can tell you, I got the bivalent uh, COVID and the uh, the uh, high dose flu because I'm over 65 and the high dose flu was worse than the COVID. I had a sore arm for a couple of days. The COVID, nothing, no problems at all. Is it too early to get the flu shot because it only lasts four to six months? No, no, it's a very good question. No, it's perfectly fine to get it now. And actually, my wife and I did last week. So it's it la the, the 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 protection is related to yes, the time from uh, the uh, the va immunization until uh, you get infected, but it's also it related. Uh, to the uh, strength of the vaccine, and some vaccines are better than others. I think the last few years they've been only about fifty percent, and this this I don't know what what this is yet. We don't have the data, but I would not wait to get vaccinated. I would go ahead and get vaccinated now. That would be my recommendation. So, if no one yeah. has any more questions, oh no, I had okay. I okay. Had been a long time. How have you been? Um, so there are these boosters that keep coming out every so many months. Um, what's the difference from one to the other? And when are we going to get to a point where um, basically everybody gets the same booster, you get it once a year? So, Harvey, I, uh, if, hello, and I remember your days as a regulator at the U. Um, the question really depends on the virus rather than, uh, than any science, the, how much the virus changes. And so, and how often would you do a booster? Probably from a practical point of view, every year at the, uh, at, at, uh, at the most. Uh, you wouldn't do it every six months. The other problem we have, though, right, is compliance on these things. Uh, I'm convinced that the present bivalent 
vaccine, as I showed that quote from the New England Journal article, is very valuable. But there's been huge complacency in the uptake of this uh, bivalent booster has been poor. So I think it's going to be a matter of what, how much the virus changes and how, and then also as it changes, the one thing that tends to happen is it adapts to the host. And so we're hoping that as it changes, it becomes less and less virulent. So those are all factors to consider when we ask or think about how many boosters do we need? And how, how long is this going to go on? I kind of think for the coronavirus, it's going to be a yearly booster, just like it is now for influenza, for the combined influenza A and Bs. Um, another question, is funding for COVID research still available or is it drying up? Well, uh, I think Bill had a slide that indicates that uh, at least for certain aspects like long COVID, there's, uh, there's evidence that there will be increased uh, support. Uh, My understanding is that uh, there was a surge in COVID funding during the height of the pandemic and that may have maybe stagnating some now, but for long COVID, uh, the, uh, the government sees a clear direction here of prob probable growth and, and uh, long-term consequences for public health and has in, made the initial investment of uh, 1.15 billion. I think that's just the beginning. There's much to do, not only in the lab science side, but particularly in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, digital, for example, surveillance. There is no, for example, no, there is no single surveillance system for long COVID. So that we're just at the beginning of, of having to build out uh, both in terms of the biomedical and in terms of the information technology dimensions of this mass. It is a massive problem. And uh, it, it, you may have heard the Lancet Commission on COVID, the Lancet is a prestigious uh, British journal, came out last week called uh, a term, the uh, pandemic response, a massive global failure on multiple fronts. And uh, we don't want that to happen with, with the long COVID uh, challenge we have. Um, I, have I, have another, I, have a, I have another question. So there's a lot of research going on uh, using drugs which are not antivirals, metformin, for example. I know there's a study going on at the U, uh, hasn't been published yet, but there seems to be uh, some promising results. What do you think about the, the future of drug development as far as treatment of, of COVID? Are we going to see really uh, a major effect from um, antivirals? Or are we going to see effect from some of these other drugs which are not antivirals that may have a positive impact on the disease? I'm not sure, Harvey, how the uh, uh, how the uh, development of antivirals is going because the candidate ones that we have and some have partial approval, as you know, seem to have worse side effects than the disease itself. And so that's depressing. On the other hand, uh, you know, antivirals are uh, uh, really the second step, right? If the vaccine fails and we have antivirals. So I think there's clearly a place for them. But, uh, you know, what piece of the pie we're going to see, you know, allocated to antivirals versus like immuno, uh, immunologically active substances or whatever uh, uh, is hard to tell. So my question is, is there any correlation between the severity of COVID and long COVID? Yes. Uh, the uh, acute disease tends to uh, uh, influence the likelihood that long COVID is going to develop, and that's for sure. So if you have severe acute disease, you're more likely to, uh, to have long COVID than if your disease is mild or essentially asymptomatic. Yes. As an addendum to that, uh, because the uh, older people, elderly populations are more vaccinated than those, let's say, 20 to 40 or 20 to 50, the growth in long COVID now is, is tending to be in the latter group. 
uh, even even younger than 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 twenty. Uh, so, whereas without vaccination, no question that the it would, would seem that the older uh, uh, segment of the population would be more vulnerable to long COVID. Vaccination levels do make a difference in uh, susceptibility to long COVID. Well, thank you everyone for attending this TC Talks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Belfour and uh, Bill Hoffman uh, for this wonderful presentation. It has been so interesting and um, informative. And I know that we are all um, just a little bit more educated um, and concerned <laughs> about um, as we should be, what is happening. So um, thank you so much uh, for enlightening us and answering our questions. Um, and uh, we'd love to have you back again um, in the future.